when you took office, you were not only young, uh, you're also a woman. Right. I mean, are these both pluses or minuses? Actually, I think that uh, whoever gets to be appointed in a position of importance must adjust considering her constraints. I did not consider my being young as a uh, as a, an inherent obstacle. I thought that there were things that I had to adjust more and that my expectations had to be lowered because of that. A very senior justice would naturally be treated very differently from one who is young. And the position does not automatically carry with it all the traditions of the past. So you have to earn the respect of people and show your leadership. You had to, I had to make a distinction between ambient noise, which I thought would be brought about by emotions, brought about by failed expectations, and the tasks that really needed doing. What was very good is that when I show focus on the work ahead, and I make it a point to uh, emphasize that it is a collective responsibility of the court. Mm -hmm. You had everybody behind you. There would, there would be no dissent on what was necessary to be done in order to provide justice to our people. Maybe there would be uh, proposals on alternative approaches right. to things. Maybe there would be a reference to the solution that had been done in the past. But ultimately, it would be a collective Correct. decision. And this is something I am very proud of. That this court, this court, regardless of uh, um, the fact that uh, a lot of emotions uh, accompanied my appointment. You rise from nowhere, right? Well, <laughs> well yes, yes, you're actually accurate there. Uh, actually proved to be professional in every sense. So even choosing to, to do a collegial kind of uh, consensus body in the Supreme Court, that's also your choice. What were the biggest challenge you faced when you came in and you realized you had this body? I think it was a very uh, realistic appraisal of my situation that led me to conclude that the only way to lead is by consensus. And for the lower court employees and for the other judges to lead by example. So by consensus and by example. And I thought that uh, Maybe the fact that there are alternative views, instead of being rejected outright by me, actually provided a better alternative. Wisdom is not the monopoly of any one person. I think that when uh, a course of action has to be adjusted because there are dangers being point out to, pointed out to you by your colleagues, then it would be wise to listen to those warnings. And uh, that is one thing I appreciate from uh, my colleagues, that uh, the uh, discussion in the end bank has been very, very dynamic. Everyone has been free to give his input because the, when I was appointed as chief justice, I thought that I would encourage as much discussion as possible. And it has happened. So what you have are more ideas being pushed more aggressively, more cooperation from the, the ground, and I always carry the message that the secret to reform is in the individual who will be involved on the ground himself. It must be owned by every stakeholder. It cannot be only attributed to one person. That's not a smart way to uh, bring about uh, transformational uh, changes but rather when the individual sees that it is in his best professional interest, it aligns uh, with his uh, values, the values that he carried with him to the judiciary, that's why he joined in the mm -hmm. first place, mm -hmm. that the best way to deliver justice is what must always be consistently sought, and it must be done in a community where you share your expectations, and uh, you share, and you pinpoint responsibilities very carefully you know, it has been very fast. I cannot believe that in the three years I have been he here, the changes would be embraced by employees in this manner. 
For example, the problems that I have right now, Maria, is the change. The uh, projects are not being brought to localities fast enough. Mm -hmm. The problem is how to manage expectations and demands mm -hmm. that the same kind of support system being carried out in the reform areas will also be carried out as fast as possible to the farthest courts that we have. If that is not, uh, is, if that is not such a happy problem to have, I don't know what is a happy problem. So I, I, I am welcoming all of this. And the uh, pressure is enormous. And uh, because the, the hope, you can really feel it, it's in the air. They want you so much to succeed. So you, you, you don't want to fail. Uh, the people, but at the same time you recognize that not all the factors are within your control. For example, we must have the prosecution and the public defenders very tightly working with us. You have to have the investigative uh, uh, forces and the law enforcement forces very, very tightly also working, not on the merits of any particular case, but on the process itself. So. Uh, I, I carry the message even when I talk with the prosecutors and the public attorneys and the police in the Justice Sector Coordinating Council that this should be seen as a justice sector movement to bring justice to people. And we should no longer be uh, thinking in terms of silos mm. where we think that our terms of reference ends here and I don't really care about what happens to the other branches. No, we must care and we must show our people that we care enough so that we talk, we coordinate, we harmonize our rules to the extent where it is possible, all because you want the system to make sense. And it will never make sense if we keep on thinking uh, in silos. So we're, we're doing that right now. That's a massive culture change in a bureaucracy that, uh, that has had a lot of problems to deal with. Uh, what pushed that culture change forward? I uh, appointed for myself to ensure that I don't uh, breach the line of judicial independence. I pro appointed a conscience person. I call her a resident ombudsman for judicial independence. So that whenever I'm talking to anyone in the other branches, I will keep on asking her, am I already breaching the limit? Well, uh, th the point is I always must be aware of the limit of cooperation. And I encourage the Department of Justice to likewise also observe that limit. Mm -hmm. So we are careful whenever we have an agreement to always emphasize the professional independence of each agency. At the same time, recognizing that the only way you can work in order to bring about justice is to have coordination in specific areas. So the demarcation where we can have joint activities mm -hmm. is made clear for every activity node. So I thought that we can defend it uh, even when there is already someone who might ask our, uh, uh, whether we are too partial to the Department of Justice. I, I, I keep on telling them the Department of Justice itself has two, mm -hmm. two uh, colliding uh, agencies that it is supervising, the National Prosecution Service and the Public Attorney's Office. But the thing is that we must not let these formal problems stand in the way of finding good solutions. And uh, it, has, uh, it has been the cry of our people for the longest time. So uh, it has been working very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that uh, the court is very proud of. You've incorporated technology. I'm very sensitive to communication, for example. And I have to recognize that uh, today's people communicate, work, live, play in ways different from how they used to do that. And it is wrong mm -hmm. to, to, ignore, to ignore that environment. So one uh, philosophy should be how do we best parlay these technological uh, opportunities into the best way of serving justice. And uh, I thought initially that there would be strong resistance from uh, judges that are, uh, let's say, 50 and above to technology. But now you know what they're saying? Those where we have the electronic court system, they cannot imagine ever working in an environment that is not automated. Fantastic.
you were the only chief justice who is a, a woman in Southeast Asia. Yes. One of three in Asia Pacific. Yes. What, what kinds of pluses and minuses does this bring to you? The, the, the female side of my brain integrates the soft and hard parts of a situation very well. In other words, uh, uh, linear thinking is appropriate for, uh, for, uh, for plotting charts and etc. But uh, you know what, my, my approach is uh, if you're going to look at a technology, an, an, an application, it's mind mapping. Yes. So it's, it's a very intuitive, it's uh, more feminine than, uh, than masculine. Would you agree with that? I, I agree. And yes. uh, that is how I approach things. An idea cannot be pushed until there is already a buy-in. Mm -hmm. And the buy-in will be a mixture of the intuitive, emotional, even economic interests at play not, that are not discrete in a particular individual because they, 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 they are always in a sense of movement even inside an individual. And when individuals meet, that will also move. So I have uh, quite a strong sense of uh, a, a collective, uh, a, uh, the collective feel for something. And I think that, the, and then I am able to show that I speak from within. Some say from the heart, mm -hmm. from the heart then, because I appeal to, I, I think it's important to appeal to the deepest values of people. At the end of the day, what is a system? What is a justice system? If it is not made of people who are trying to mimic, to the extent possible, a sense of fairness, uprightness, and the appropriate recompense in a world that they collectively call the world of justice. But certainly in a country like the Philippines where institutions have been weak, these vested interests come at you in different ways. You live in this country. How do you maintain your independence? When I was interviewed I, uh, for the uh, chief justice position, I mentioned seven principles that I live by, but I thought that I would summarize them now for sure, you, for this please. interview. And I thought that it would be, I use the principle of self-limiting. In other words, I limit my wants, I limit my associations so that I can be freer. So if I say I will live within much, much below my means, I will associate with less people than I can actually associate with. If I tie myself to less interests than are attractive to me at the moment, that means, and if I do not attach myself to a particular opinion, at this particular point in time, my ability to respond to the call for an impartial adjudication will be multiplied in many ways. So it is also a process of self-examination, seeing in my heart what binds me, what enshackles me. So the difficult part about this is that it has also to be embraced by my own family because that is where my deepest affections lie. So my husband has to have that also. My children also understand the limitations uh, that uh, are naturally there simply because they are associated with me. And your family adheres to that. I mean, we've yes. seen powerful women whose family have, have taken advantage of the power. I have not uh, may been uh, embarrassed about saying it, but everyone has in my family has seen it as a charge from God. So if it is a charge, if it is a trust, then you absolutely cannot even think of abusing it. That's, that's too dangerous. That would be the most treasonous thing to do to try to abuse a trust. Hashtag CJ Pasi Sereno. <laughs> when you leave office in 2030, Describe what you leave behind. Uh, consistency for 18 years. Upholding the Constitution. A life of integrity, outward and inward. And uh, at the uh, and uh, con uh, unwavering fealty to those I love. God, family, 
and of course, my expanded family now, the judiciary, and the closest friends I have. What is the biggest hurdle getting to your 2030 goal? The one biggest hurdle? I always live with a sense that there is always danger around the corner. And so I don't uh, live my life in a careless manner. And that danger can partly be physical. It can also be uh, an, uh, an operation intended to entrap me or lead me to do something that is wrong. So I have created a system of uh, not only physical security, but I have surrounded myself with a very skilled professional men and women whose primary responsibility is to make sure that the Chief Justice does no wrong. If there is any one official in government who must not be uh, associated with any wrongdoing or any failure of wisdom, it must be the Chief Justice. Fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for you, your time. Thank We've you. been speaking with Philippine Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us.